check, check. Test, 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 test. Check, check, test, test. Check, check, test, test. test. Testing, testing, check, check, testing, 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 check, one, two, check, one, two. Okay. I didn't hear it in here, but it's going through okay there. All right, good, good. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Emerge. We're glad you're here. Good morning. Y'all ready to stand and worship with us this morning? Are y'all ready to stand and worship with us this morning? That's one person. All right, let's worship the Lord. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. We'll sing and say a victory. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a There's power, amen. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Tell me what he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. I know how. You 
take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. All right, let me hear y'all. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good.
Let's pray, guys. Father, we are so thankful for your love, Lord, just for the, the unconditional agape love that you've shown us, Lord. Lord, please just help us to um, just to see your word this morning, Lord. Lord, to worship you as fully as we can. That we would touch someone through that you would touch someone through us, Lord. Lord, it's in your name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Emerge. We're glad you're here today. A couple of quick announcements before we get going. If you have not done so already, please make sure you fill out that connections card that's inside your bulletin. That lets us know who's here and any information we might need or you might need to share with us in the office. And then you can place that in the buckets in the back as you head out along with your offering. Uh, it is, again, great to see everybody here let me hit a couple of quick announcements for you coming up. The first one um, is to remind you that this afternoon at 3 o'clock, there will be a Safe Sanctuaries training. If you want to work with children here at the church, we require everybody to go through Safe Sanctuaries. We take care of the kids and make sure we know all the right procedures. If you are interested or curious or would like to work with that, you can come to the Wesley Fellowship class downstairs over there at 3 o'clock this afternoon. It takes about 45 minutes. Uh, but if you, And again, if, if you would like to volunteer, if you want to help with children, if you want to work in the children's ministries, you need to get that done. So I encourage you to come to be a part of that and get that taken care of. Um, the other thing is to remind you that not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday, on the 20th, we start our Wednesday night out dinners again. There's still brown bag dinners. You need to bring your own. Uh, we're not quite where we can serve meals and do what we want to do. But we are going to gather, spread out in here. And then we're starting a really neat study. And I encourage you, if you don't come for dinner, at least come for the study, which will be at about 6.15 uh, on those nights. And we're studying a, a, from a book called When Helping Hurts, a wonderful study in missions and outreach. Sometimes we have all these kind of skewed notions of what missions is, and we're going to be talking about that a lot in the next few weeks ahead, but I encourage you to come. It is a wonderful study to make you really think about what it means to be called to be in witness and be in mission, so I encourage you to come be a part of that. Two other things I want to share with you. The first one is the focus we're going to be doing this year, we're going to really focus on a lot of our outreach slash missions ministries. We've got a lot of things going on in the life of the church, and most of us are not really familiar with them. So each month, we're going to take one or two of our projects and make a point of focusing on them so you can hear about them and see what's going on. This month, we're going to be focusing on two of our, our outreach ministries. One is one we've been talking about, Celebrate Recovery, and we're going to continue talking about that one. They kicked off last Tuesday with 53 folks here for their first meeting, which is absolutely wonderful uh, with Celebrate Recovery. Um, the other one we're going to be talking about this month is a, a ministry that we have reaching out to the, the people in the, the, the young people in the YDC uh, and want to reach out and, and care for them. It's a ministry that a lot of folks aren't familiar with. Therefore, let me tell you what's going on today. We're going to have somebody later on in the month stand up here and tell you more details about it. But on that back table back there, or if you're in a Sunday school class, they'll also be in your Sunday school classes, are note cards. And what we're asking folks to do is just write a note of encouragement. You don't know the people they're going to, but sometimes these young folks have been locked up. They've gone the wrong path in life. They've made mistakes along the way. And we want to be people who encourage them, call them back to the path they need to be on. Um, if you have questions as you head out today, uh, April Trussell will be back there by those cards, and she can give you a little more details about it. Uh, but grab a card. Write a note. It doesn't take an awful lot to change a life in an amazing way. We're going to be talking a lot about being witnesses and sharing with the world. So, again, on that back table, it's also in the Sunday school rooms if you're currently with a Sunday school class that's meeting right now. And the last thing I want to say is a Thanksgiving. We are in the process, good Lord willing the creek don't rise, of getting our live stream up for this service. You may have noticed the new cameras. They're in the back right now going through all of the, the equipment to make that operate. And so hopefully by next week we'll be live streaming, which means uh, folks, can, now that doesn't mean you get to stay home. Right. It means that we'll be able to live stream for those who are not here, and if they come back later, it'll be up and recorded, and they can check it later, and we can have an outreach for a few others. That's only possible because folks stepped up in tremendous ways to both help us get the equipment, uh, to help us learn how to operate the equipment, and it's just a wonderful example of folks being, as we'll share in a few minutes, in mission and in ministry. There's so many opportunities for that. And now here's a simple one. Look around this room. No, seriously, look around. Don't, I didn't just say that. Look around this room. There may be folks you don't recognize. There may be folks you don't know. Would you stand and wave at them, greet them, and let me, before you do that, before you do that, if you see somebody you don't know, 
Make a, a plan when the service is over and we're all milling. Make sure you go introduce yourself. Learn one new person today as we grow closer to the body of Christ. Would you stand and greet one another this morning? Hi, I'm Larry. It's good to meet everybody. Hi. I answer to hate you. <laughs> We've had a chance to greet each other this morning. Before we go any further, I want to invite any children, K3 through K5, if you would like to go to Children's Church, you want to meet Miss Brenda up front here. If the rest of us will come back to our seats, let's have a seat, and we're going to have a few moments of prayer as the children head out on us. A couple of things to lift up in prayer this morning as we're gathered together. Um, first, I want to lift up as a prayer for our nation. Uh, if you watch the news, it's just been heartrending. And uh, as the church, as people of grace and love, we need to be lifting up all of those. I don't care where you stand on the political spectrum. Uh, we need to be those who are in ministry of grace and love to the world. So we're going to lift up that and the wounds that have been caused. The other thing I want to lift up, uh, we want to lift up this ongoing COVID crisis, but maybe a lot of you are not familiar. They had a really serious outbreak over at Cordelia Manor among some of our most vulnerable folks. A number of our members who are over there are down with COVID right now, um, and uh, that's concerning. You see some of the names in the bulletin. Um, and in all of those folks who are, are, are in this crisis time, we want to lift them up. But that's a special place of prayer because that is uh, one of the most dangerous uh, segments of the population to have this. So we'll take a few minutes and lift up all of our prayers uh, and then share those two specifically. But as we bow our heads, take a few minutes in silent prayer and lift up those concerns that you have in your life, the things that you want to lay before the Lord as we gather this day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and to worship, to be with friends and to celebrate. But Lord, as we gather, we recognize that we're in a difficult time in our world. A number of our church family can't be here, and we're in smaller numbers, and we're worried about those who are isolated and separated. And so we lift up all of those, those who are here this day, those who are watching on the video and those who are just not able to be here at all and we ask for your blessings and your strength not only in our community and our church but all around the world. Lord as we bow our heads in prayer we are uh, aware that this crisis of the COVID situation has spiked in this recent times particularly in Cordelia Manor and in other places and so we say a special prayer. Be with those who are on the front lines, those in the healthcare field uh, who are taking care of all of those who are hurt and struggling. Lord, as we look for vaccines and we look for health in all things, let us not forget the first place we need to look is in your gracious hand and your power and your presence. Lord, beyond as if that were not enough, beyond that, we're living in a time where we're tearing each other apart. We're living in a time when we don't listen. We're living in a time when we demonize people who disagree with us. And Lord, we simply ask for grace. We ask for your love. Help us before we open our mouths to remember that everyone we meet is your precious child. Everyone we speak to was someone for whom Christ died. Everyone, whatever position they hold, whatever attitude they have, whatever their political leaning, is one of yours, is one for whom you gave your life and who you desperately call unto yourself. So, Lord, let us speak with grace. Let us speak with love. Let us be agents of healing. Lord, we can have our opinions and our positions, but let us do so in your way, through your eyes and through your hands. Remind us that what matters most is how we walk as disciples. What matters most is how we proclaim the love of our Savior. So Lord, whatever we're doing, whether it's in political arenas or simply at the Walmart, whether it's in our homes or our schools or our businesses, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your hope, your joy, and your love. Give us your eyes. And for all the things that are on our plates, all the things we're worried and concerned about, give us the grace to trust you to lay them on your altar and know that all things work together for good for them that love you. Lord, we profess our love for you this day. Work for your good in all of those things, in all of our lives, and in all that we are, that we might simply grow in faith, grow in discipleship, and grow in our witness to you. For we pray this now and always in the name of he who conquered sin and death, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Would y'all stand again? Singing out, are you hurt? Are you hurt? Yeah, good morning. It is good to see everybody this morning. We're going to, as I alluded to a second ago, we're going to start a new series today. Um, and we're going to be focusing, as I said before this year, on our outreach. Uh, it's an important thing. Sometimes we know of missions projects, we see a little announcement or we see a little thing. But sometimes as the whole church, we miss it. And that's particularly difficult here, given that we have three different worshiping congregations. And you may not get connected with folks. So we're going to really focus on that. But even more importantly, 
for focusing on that is because it is our purpose, and we're going to wrestle with that a little bit. We've got two scriptures we're going to explore today. One of them is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, and the other was from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3, and we'll get to those in just a minute. But the series is called To Infinity and Beyond, and y'all know where that comes from, right? Where does it come from? All right, good. So y'all already know. Toy Story was a great movie. How many of you ever saw Toy Story? The first one. I'm not talking about anything. I don't care at this moment. I'm talking about the first one. But I loved that movie. It was a lot of fun um, just because it brought back so many memories. How many here had little plastic soldiers and, you know, when, when those come out on there? You had all that. It was just really great in that one. For those who are not familiar, in the story Toy Story, it's an animated feature by Pixar, uh, there's a wonderful uh, uh, two main characters in it. The first one is Woody, and Woody, you know, is, is a cowboy, and his little toy cowboy's got the string, and when you pull him, he says uh, neat cowboy things, and he's the favorite toy in the room. And then a new toy comes, and he's the new electric one with all the lights and whistles and bells, and he's Buzz Lightyear. He's the spaceman on that one. And there's a lot of different themes that go on in the movie. I'm not going to go from them here, but I love the dynamic between those two main characters. Woody is the one who's been there all the time. Woody is the one who is familiar and comfortable, and Woody likes where he is. And then in comes Buzz, and he upsets the order of things, and none of us like having the order of things upset. And not only that, it's upset because Buzz has things Woody does not. He's got wings that fold out. He's got laser lights. He's got cool stuff. And he's got that catchphrase, to infinity and beyond. Now, the reason I mention, the reason I like that in there is because there's something that each sort of represents. If Woody is against anything, it's against infinity and beyond. Woody likes it right here. Thank you very much. This is where it's all comfortable. This is what he knows. This is where he is in the hierarchy. Buzz, in both his catchphrase and in his very existence, represents pushing everybody out of where they're familiar. And I want to kind of play with that as we go forward. Now, don't take that too far. That's just a metaphor. It's just to get us thinking about that. But one of the things I want to suggest as we begin playing with this is in a lot of ways we in the church wrestle with that dynamic. We're comfortable often. We like things the way they are. We like songs we're familiar with. How many here are sitting in the same seat you sat in last week? Yes, jacket. Uh, it's not uncommon. We, we, we kind of have that sort of, and there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't get me, me wrong there. But there's that sense, all of us, whether it's church or anything else, like what's comfortable. We don't like being called. And that's scary. To infinity? That's big. I don't want to go to big. I want nice, manageable chunks. That is human nature. But as we wrestle with what it means to be the church, we wrestle with where Christ is calling us, we need to recognize that though he does not use these phrases... Jesus is literally calling us to infinity and beyond. God is calling us to have an eternal frame, an ongoing mindset, to be thinking beyond the box in which we might happen to live at any given moment. So we're going to play with that a little bit this morning. We talked about our whole year is going to be based on 2021, a year to refocus on being people of one way, of one God, of one body, and of one mission. And we're going to be playing with that along the way. But today we're going to talk about, let's get to the basics of what Jesus calls us to so we can then develop out from it. And we're going to find it this morning in the story of the book of Acts. Now, most of you know Acts is the second volume of a two-volume work. The first volume is the Gospel of Luke. And if you don't believe me, go read the introduction to the Gospel of Luke and then jump ahead and read the introduction to the, gospel, or to the, the book of Acts and you'll find it's just the volume two. The story continues. It's the sequel. And it moves on from that point. And it begins with this marvelous story. And we're in Acts 1, and I'm going to read verses 6 down through 11. And by the way, go back to this. We're going to keep returning to this throughout the next few weeks because I think it's really important. We're going to pull this apart. You're going to get so sick of Acts 1 uh, for a lot of reasons. But let's play with it for the moment this morning. Again, hear the word of the Lord from Acts 1, starting at verse 6. So when they had come together, that's the disciples, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was, while he was going, and they were gazing upward, 
toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, we're going to just focus on a little bit. We're going to keep coming back to that verse in the next weeks. So it's a lot of meat in there. And I encourage you to go back and read it and wrestle with it. It's going to be in your readings, your weekly readings every week as we pull that apart. I want to focus on one part in this story in particular, though. Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. That's your job. You will be my witnesses. And what I'd like us to do a little bit this morning is wrestle with what it means to be a witness. If that's what Jesus has called his disciples to do, and by the way, this is not just the historical aspect. You and I are disciples. We're called to be witnesses as well, and we want to play with that just a little bit this morning. So if you follow the notes, let's begin with note number one, and we'll begin unpacking it a little bit. But let me remind you, as you're getting your notes out there that are in the bulletin, you have weekly readings in there. I encourage you, if you're not already doing a weekly devotion, to keep reading that. Take some time to share it with your family. If you've got a prayer group or a small group, the places we get most depth in things is when we bounce them off of people. I love the opportunity to share and to have other people go, wait a minute, I read it this way. So I encourage you to make sure you're doing that, to take it a little further and a little deeper. But let's begin with clarifying what Jesus said, and there's an important fact of this. This is note number one in your readings, and it goes something like this. Our purpose in this life is to share our experience of the resurrected Christ with others. Our purpose, the reason for which you were born, hear that. This isn't just something you do occasionally when you have a moment. Our purpose in life is to share our experience of the resurrected Christ. And I want to put in emphasis there, the reason I had you write resurrected is because this isn't a historical story. Okay. There are lots of folks out there. I had a lot of them in, in seminary. There are a lot of professors out there who can study Jesus as a historical figure, and that's fine. That's wonderful. That's not what we're talking about here. This is about a personal relationship with the risen Jesus Christ. This is about how Jesus lives here and now in you and me. You don't get to hold him at a 2,000-year distance and pretend that it's some ancient historical story that has no relevance to your life. We're told to share our experience with that living, resurrected Christ. Let's kind of deal with that a little bit. What does it mean to share that experience? What does it mean to be that witness? Well, the first step is to recognize a little bit about what we're talking about when we say witnesses. And, and to give you an example, I am horrible to watch history movies with, right? Um, and I was waiting for my wife to give an amen there. We, we, we don't do those together at all. And the reason is this. I'm horrible. I have studied history for years and years, and I'm one of those guys who, who gets into the minutia of it. In other words, I'm going to study this, and then I want to go look up another thing and cross-reference and see if it's true. I know it's geeky. It's what I am. Sorry. But I go in, and I study it to that depth and everything. So when I watch it in a movie and they get something wrong, then I'm like, ah. I can't believe anything else in here. That part is wrong, and it's really bad. I mean, I, little little nitpicky things. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and he mispronounced a name, and then I got to where I don't believe anything he says. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I actually had an experience, really, with, with that sort of thing with history movies. Back when I worked for the Park Service, uh, way back uh, in the 80s, in the late 80s, we had uh, a film crew come, and they were filming the movie. Some of you all saw it, the movie Glory. You may have seen the movie Glory. The movie Glory is about the 54th Massachusetts during the Civil War. They were one of the first African-American regiments that fought uh, for the Union during the Civil War. And they came out to the Civil War site that I was working in, and they were trying to do some research. Cool. And the guy came in, I happened to be the guy on duty that day, and the, the, the film guy came in, and he said, we're looking for information on how they trained soldiers in the, in the Civil War. And I said, got you covered. And I went over to the cabinet, and I pulled out an original copy of the 1855 drill manual uh, of the period that they would have learned from. And I opened up and said, what do you want to know? And he started asking me questions, and I thought, I'm in the movie business. It's kind of cool. And then he said, now, what did they do in hand-to-hand -hand combat? You know those sticks with the the pillows on the end and they bopped each other with them. How did they make those? And I said, they didn't do those. He said, no, no, you know, so they could practice and learn. I said, they didn't do those. He said, well, you know, when they had the bayonets, how did they fight? And I said, they learned how to stand. That's all they learned. And he said, no, 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 you know, like the, the straw thing. You've seen the movies, the guy stick the thing in there. How did they do that? I said, they didn't do that. They simply said, you stand like this and you do that. That's all they did. He said, no, 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 we want to have that scene where they're you know, pretending to fight. They did not do that. And the guy goes, yes, they did. And I said, I'm looking at the book. 
book, 1855 book. No, they did not do that. I have read the diaries. I've looked at the accounts. I know what I'm talking about. They did not do that. And he goes, yeah, but we want to have it in the movie. Okay. But if you're asking me what I know, I'm telling you, no, they didn't do it. I, got, I studied it. I'm calling it like I see it. This is what's there. Did anybody see the movie Glory? You may or may not remember they have a wonderful scene where they're learning to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it's, they didn't want to look at the real thing. And I had trouble with that. I'm only sharing that with you, though, because here's what a witness is. You came, those movie guys came and they asked me, this was my profession, this is what I did, I had the resources. You may not like what I share, you may not choose to follow what I share, that's really not my business. I'm simply telling you, this is what I know. This is what I've experienced. Every day I come to this park. Every day I put on a reproduction wool uniform and stand in the Savannah heat. Every day I do this and study and research. This I know. Now, you don't have to listen. You don't have to pay attention to it. You don't have to agree with me. But this is the one thing that I know about this. That's all a witness is. A witness is somebody who says, this I've experienced. This I know. This I have walked through. This matters to me. A witness is one who has personal experience. Now, in the story we read just a moment ago, that's what Jesus is reminding the disciples. Now, this is nothing new. The disciples are not the first ones with personal experience. As a matter of fact, if you look all through the New Testament, you can find it in the Old Testament as well, but just I'll focus on the New Testament. If you look through the New Testament, one of the things that you will discover is there's lots of places where folks just said what they knew. For example... The Samaritan woman in John 4 that Jesus encounters at the well, after they have their interchange, she runs into town. She goes, let me tell you all about this guy I met. She doesn't argue theology with them. She doesn't explain to them what she goes, I'm just telling you what I saw. This was pretty cool. The Gerasene demoniac, the guy you remember in the story, he's in, in uh, uh, Mark 5 and, and Luke 8. He's the guy that lived in the cemetery, and he was crazy, and he'd scratch himself with, with, with rocks and pottery sherds, and they'd cut him up in chains, and he'd break the chains. Scary guy. Jesus cast legion of demons out of him. And if you remember the story, the people come up later, and he's sitting there decently clothed, cleaned, and the scripture says, in his right mind. He's a living witness of something that happened. And we're also told, by the way, that folks don't want to hear it. They, it scares them. They're more scared of him when he's healed than when he's not. That's a sermon for another time. But his very existence says, something has happened to me. Something has changed me. Something's wrong. And the disciples themselves, and I've shared before, one of my favorite stories of the disciples is after the resurrection, after they encounter the living Christ, there's that wonderful moment. After the moment we've read here where he ascends into heaven, there's one where Peter's out there in Jerusalem and he's proclaiming who Jesus is and the Sanhedrin, the same court that arrested and had Jesus crucified, shows up and they tell Peter, you better shut up. You remember what happened. And Peter says, no. Peter essentially says, look, you can crucify me. You can do whatever you want, but this is true and I'm going to keep sharing it. And people look around and say, wait a minute, these aren't the same guys who a few days before were afraid to say anything. Now you can't shut them up. Something has happened. A witness has experience and shares that experience. Look at the story we just shared. The story sets, and you can go back and look at it, we're, we're some 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. We're told in the scriptures that Jesus, in the time after he was resurrected and before he ascended, he's been out teaching. People have seen him. He's shared stuff with folks. The disciples are hanging out. I want you to think about what that must have been like as a disciple. You know, this is part two, and, and, and they're excited. If you thought it was cool when Jesus was with us before, when he was bringing people out from the dead and healing folks and facing down the Pharisees, how about now when he was dead and now he's alive? Man, this is going to be great, right? But you also got to be thinking as a disciple, how's he going to top that? You know, what's the next step? This is, something else has got to be happening. And it's in that context as they're standing outside of Jerusalem on the hill there that the disciples ask him, okay, what's next? is now the time you're going to restore Israel. Now, remember, they're still thinking very limited. They're still dreaming small. Is now the time that Israel gets to be the big bully on the block. Is now the time. But what they're asking even deeper is something like this. All right, Jesus loved act one. That was really cool. That crucifixion thing was hard, but man, what an ending with that resurrection. We loved it. What do we get in the sequel? 
is now the time we get to see the cool stuff, right? Notice they're still thinking in terms of, we can't wait to watch what you do, right? And then Jesus says, well, first of all, i got a couple of things for you. Number one, you don't get to know. I love that line. It's not for you to know the Father's plans. Personal note here, when folks begin telling you the Jesus is coming back on March 3rd at 522 in the afternoon, just go back to that verse go, who said you were supposed to know? That's not yours to know. It's sort of like when my kids would get into an argument, they are supposed to be cleaning their room and they started fighting instead. Nobody's ever had that problem with your kids, right? And they started squabbling and you went in, you go, I told you to clean the room. They said, yeah, but he, I don't care what he but did. Your job is cleaning the room. Don't, I, don't, don't care. Clean the room. That's what you're sent here for. It's exactly what Jesus says here. It's not for you to know that stuff. Right now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be my witness. The Holy Spirit is going to give you power. He's going to strengthen you for this. And you go out and be my witnesses. And not just, you know, right here. You're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the outermost parts of the world. We'll talk about those in later sermons in this series. But right now, I want you to focus on what he says. Your job is not to have deep theological discussions about the nature of end times. Your job is not to sit back and go, well... Look what he's able to do. Your job is to be a witness, to share what you have experienced with the world. That's what I'm calling you to do. And we're going to talk more about that as we use that along. But I want you to wrestle with that just a little bit in here. Because, see, there's a lot of misconceptions about the church. A lot of folks think church is primarily, this coming to be Christians, is primarily about getting my ticket punched for heaven. And you know that. If people ask, what is the purpose of following Jesus Christ, you will, I do not doubt, you will encounter somebody who goes, it's so I can go to heaven. It is not. You hear that? Yes, that is a benefit. But Jesus doesn't go, all right, guys, sit back. I'm going to go up to heaven, and then hopefully you'll die soon, and you can come to heaven with me. That's not what he says. It's not what he does anywhere in there. It'd be nice, at least as far as my laziness goes, if that's it. I got my fire insurance, right? Got my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And now if I get run over by a, by a herd of wildebeest or something outside the door, I'm punched. I'm ready to go. And that may be true. I don't know about the wildebeest, but it may be true. But here's the thing. There's something that has to happen between now and then. And like my kids, there's that place where Jesus goes, I don't care about the butts. I gave you a job. Did you hear the job? You are to be my witnesses. You're to share what you've experienced everywhere you go. That is our function. And sometimes we act like we're here, like a lot of us, you know, I, I'm here to be entertained for an hour a week. Let me tell you something. If this is all about you being entertained, stay home. I cannot compete with HBO and Showtime. That's not what this is about. This is about us being refueled and ready to go out and be what we are made for, the purpose for which we were placed here. And the truth is, I'm going to say this, and the vast majority of people in churches everywhere, those watching in our video, even folks sitting here, the vast majority go, yeah. And then we're going to do absolutely nothing with our Christian faith until we come back the next time and go, ooh, yeah. When we're called to be witnesses by word and deed, by presence and experience. So let's ask, if that's the case, what does real discipleship look like? What does it look like to be a witness? Because sometimes those words get us in trouble. I'm going to give you my testimony. I'm going to give you my witness. And you go, I don't know what that is. It just sounds churchy. Well, let's talk about what testimony and witness is. And we're going to look at it in Paul's writings at Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. And this is Paul talking to one of his favorite churches, the church at Philippi, and he's explaining his own experience. Right prior to the section we've read here, Paul gives his bona fides. Paul goes, look, man, I was born into a good family. I studied at the best schools. I have a perfectly clear, I am the best of the best. You wish you were as good as me. That's not what he says, but that's essentially it. He's, he's giving you the whole thing. And if you read what Paul says, you're going to sit back and go, I can't be in that. I'm no good. I'm not a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I'm not born into the proper tribe. I don't have all the wisdom and knowledge. And a lot of people do that, by the way. A lot of people in the church go, I know I was called to be a witness, but uh, I'm not very good at it, so I won't do anything. Paul's going, I'm really good at it, but let me explain it to you. Beginning at verse 7. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard 
as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if I somehow may attain the resurrection from, from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider what I that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Now there's a lot in there. We're going to just pull three things out of it as far as defining a witness. Paul is, an, is the ideal witness, isn't he? I mean, Paul's the one who went out, planted churches everywhere, did all of the, the one of the earliest founders of the organizational church that we know today. That's a witness. And I'm bad about it. I look at Paul and I go, I can't do that. That, that's just, I'm not that, you know, that's, that's not my deal. I have a hunch there's a lot out here go, I, I'm not even as bad as Larry is. I'm worse. That's sad, but that, people will say that. The call is, what is Paul saying here? Let me look at three things I want you to look at that he's suggesting to. Being a witness for Christ. If we're called to be a witness, it's going to entail three things that I want you to think about. And I want you to take this afterwards and ask what it means for you. I'm giving you nice broad definitions, but what does this mean for you, your life, your time, and your place? Number one, it's going to entail a lifelong exploration of that relationship. It's going to entail a lifelong, as long as you're here, whether it's another 20 minutes or another 70 years, it's going to entail a lifelong exploration of that relationship between you and Jesus. Because you need to be an expert witness. And an expert witness only happens because you have been through it. You've experienced. How many ever saw the movie My Cousin Vinny? Uh, that's, it's a great movie. It's fun. For those who are not familiar with it, My Cousin Vinny is about uh, some boys who travel to the south from, from up north, and they get into trouble, and the evidence looks bad against them, and one of them calls his cousin, who's kind of a lawyer. Uh, he's not really good, but it, it's, it's a fun movie in a lot of ways, and it's kind of some neat things. But one of my favorite scenes is the lawyer's girlfriend, okay, is an expert witness as, as reserves auto mechanics, Okay. Um, now, you look at it and you go, that doesn't look like any mechanic I've ever seen in any shop I've ever been to. And he brings her on the stand because there's an issue of which car was which, who were the witnesses that saw it. And she's brought on as an expert. Let me let you watch it. Just watch the clip here real quick. It's possible because you don't know the answer. Nobody could answer that question. Your Honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Vito as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No, it is a trick question. Why is it a trick question? question. Watch this. Because Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 didn't come out till 62. And it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four-barrel carb till 64. However, in 1964, the correct ignition timing would be four degrees before top dead center. <laughs> well, oh. Um, she's acceptable, you know. <laughs> Possible. Now, I have no idea what she said there, okay? That's just not my field of things. But what I love about that scene is she knows the stuff. And one of the things you'll find out in the, in the movie is the reason she knows that is because her father owned a gar garage. She worked in the garage. She's familiar with that kind of stuff. In other words, she's an expert witness because she has lived it. Not because she has any credentials, not because she has anything particular. And, of course, she proves it. There's two parts in that I love. One is when he goes, watch this. She knows her stuff. How does she know her stuff? By living it, by growing in it, by being around it, by having it seep into every part of her being. And then I love the look on the, the prosecutor's face when she blows him out of the door and he goes, okay. Here's what happens in the Christian faith. You're called to know Christ. You're called to get to know him through prayer, through presence, through gifts, through service. You're called to get to know him through study, through sharing with fellowship, through a lifelong experience where he becomes a part of you. To where when somebody says, why are you like that? Somebody else would go, watch this. Because you have something to share. You have an expert witness quality. I love that. 
Notice also something that Paul says here. As Paul lays out uh, his, his qualification and then goes, but I, that's not it. It's this surpassing, I want to have this surpassing knowledge of Christ. This is what I want. I want to know him. I want to have him deep in my bones. I want to have a deep, thorough connection. And then he goes on to say, not that I've already obtained this. That's really important. If you ever think you have God figured out, you, ever, you know, there are folks out there who are quite content with what they learned in third grade Sunday school. I know one verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I know it only in the King James Version. Right? What does that mean? I don't know. I learned it in third grade Sunday school. I'm good with it. And there's a guy with green hair and a big sign at the football games. It's got to be good, right? But here's the deal. Do you understand it? Do you know it? Is it deep inside you? And it doesn't mean you have to be expert. Remember, we said a witness is going, this is just what I know. This is where I am and this is what I understand. You can't be a witness to something you've not experienced. Let me tell you what it is like to skydive. Never been having a clue. I've seen people do it. My own son does it. I haven't a clue. I can't be a witness to that. Have you experienced Jesus? And I'm not saying that you have to have the perfect experience. We haven't obtained it. Have you shared with Jesus? Do you have good experiences and bad experiences? Do you have something to share? Have you never grown in it? Can you sh can't share any more than you learned in vacation Bible school. Are you reading? Are you studying? Are you serving? Are you praying? Are you walking with him and talking with him and coming to know him? And when you do, that witness grows. Not that you have to have a great theological knowledge. You say, basically, this is what I know. This is what I've experienced. The second thing, if you're going to be a witness, it entails a rejection of worldly standards of success, approval, and self-righteousness. A rejection of worldly standards of success, approval, and self-righteousness. Over the years growing up in South Georgia, there is something I have come to despise, and I call it the football prayer. I played sports when I was in school, and everything else, but this is what I mean by the football prayer. Some of y'all have been there. You're gathered before the game, you're all together, and somebody comes, and sadly, sometimes it's a preacher, and he goes, he goes Lord, help us beat that other team. Help us... Show how strong and victorious. Now, let me pause there. Does that mean we shouldn't pray? Not at all. But do you honestly think God's up there going, I really care which team wins this football game? I know some of us act like that's true. But the truth is, God's not up here going, you know what? I think it matters if you get seven points and they get none. I think it matters. No. Now, a good prayer like that would be, Lord, help us do our very best. Lord, help us not to get anybody injured. Lord, help us to learn and be gracious in this. Lord, help us to play hard and have a good time. Those are good prayers because that's the kind of thing God is concerned with. Scripture shows us all. He's concerned about you as a person. He's concerned about our growth. He's concerned about who we are. Now, that doesn't mean we don't pray. We should pray about everything. But let's be careful about what we think God thinks is important. Lord, please make sure so-and-so is not in my seat on Sunday because it's my seat. And I have been sitting there for years. And I hope nobody has that prayer, but some people act like that's reality. I know somebody in a church that stared down somebody until they got up and moved because they were in their seat. And then that person never came back again. Are we rejecting the things that matter? Paul is great on this one. The, the wonderful line I love is he says, all these things, all these powers, all these strengths, I regard them as rubbish. Now, remember, he's got a great pedigree. I have done stuff you can only imagine. I come from a family you can't even touch. I am good and better than good, and I regard these as rubbish. Because in the long run, that's not what God cares about. Remember, we're talking about infinity and beyond. What is the eternal scale? If I stand before God and say, God, I was a good preacher. Stop laughing. God, I was a good preacher. God, I did everything I was supposed to. And God says, did you love your neighbor as yourself? Did you dedicate yourself to knowing me? Because ultimately, if what matters is the folks with, you preach so good. If that's all that matters, you missed it. If all that matters is are you great at your job, that's perfect. Be good at your job. Do the best you can be, but do it to honor and glorify God. 
Because those things in and of themselves do not matter. You don't get to go before God on that final day and go, Lord, I had a cool car. And God's going to go, so what? Did you do what I told you to do? Did you serve the way I told you to serve? Did you love as I told you? Did you get to know me at all? By the way, one thing I love about that whole story in there is that uh, uh, Paul is really, Philippians is one of the most passionate, and some of y'all already know this. These letters were designed to be read. They were designed to be sent to the church, and somebody would stand up and read them. And the word that the English Bibles translate as rubbish is wrong. The word in Greek that Paul actually used was skubalon. As your 50-cent word, take it out, blow everybody away, but be careful. Skubalon is an offensive word. In Greek, if you went out and said, why, that's skubalon, people would be shot. Because you know what it means? And y'all bear with me. It literally means human excrement. That's what Paul used. In other words, and you'll never hear a preacher do this again, but I'm going to do it. Paul said, all that stuff is crap. I have a feeling that it was shocking to the person who had to read that to the church. All these things I count as rubbish. I count them as rubbish. That's not what Paul said. And I'm only telling you that because you need to hear the depth of Paul's passion. Paul's going, it's not just something you ought not do. I'm telling you, this is garbage. This is all that matters. These things that you invest yourself in, they should be flushed. What matters is are you a witness for Christ? Do you love God with everything you've got? Are you serving and caring for your neighbor? Are you there yet? No, but we press on towards the prize. This is what matters. Do you have that passion? Do you have that desire to say, Lord, I want to know what's more important than whether or not I have the latest fashions. Lord, I want to know what's more important than that my hair looks great. See, some of us don't have to worry about that. This is the call that we're given. What's hindering your fullest commitment? I just don't have time. No, your time's invested in something else. Is it scuba on or is it something of value? No, I, just, I don't think I can do that. Really? Or is it just you don't want to? No, I think other people are better. Or is it just that you don't want to put the effort in, you'd rather see somebody else do it? You see, we're all there. We're all guilty of those sort of excuses along the way. And Paul says, are they important or are they garbage? Make sure you know that. To be a witness is to recognize the things we so often put time and energy into don't matter. And are we invested in the things that do? And last but not least, uh, being a disciple entails a willingness to change and grow. Bad words. I've said it before. Nobody likes change unless you do it, right? I hate change unless you change. I can tell you all sorts of ways you ought to change, but I shouldn't have to change, right? Change is a hard thing. I have encountered, and this COVID issue, it really has hit me because we've had to do more technologically than we ever had before. And that's when I know I'm old. It just doesn't come naturally to me. Can I just say that? I, I, I realize I grew up in, in, in school where you actually use note cards and, and stacks of books. You didn't have an internet to go check. We try to learn all this stuff, and it's difficult. And I've used this example before because it shows how narrow-minded I am. I get very angry at my father. Most of y'all know my father's a retired airline pilot. He flew massive, complicated jets all around the world. The man cannot operate his cell phone. I call him, he's like, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't get the message. It's like, no, Dad, here's the truth. I've seen the cockpit of a 747. It is immensely complicated, and if I can figure out a cell phone and you can fly a 747, I know you can figure out the cell phone. You know why he can't figure out the cell phone? He don't want to. That's not an amen moment, John. Here's the thing. Dad doesn't want to because dad's 86 years old and he doesn't want, it's just too hard. And I understand that because it's really hard. We were working on this uh, uh, live stream stuff yesterday and they were all back in the back going, and you do this, this, this. And I heard, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I know my dad hears that when I say, well, just hit the text button and do this. But here's the truth. I have to learn it. I'm in the same boat. I don't want to. I want to do what I already know what I'm already comfortable with, what I'm already familiar with, and I don't want to be challenged because that makes me sweat and it works a little hard. But the truth is growth is about changing. You do not lose weight if you don't exercise and eat better. 
You do not bulk up muscles unless you start lifting weights and putting exercise into it. You do not learn to be smarter unless you read something harder. And ch- if all you're ever going to read is comic books, you ain't never getting any further. Right? If all you ever do is that stuff you learned in Sunday school, you're going nowhere. Paul says this. And this is, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. He goes, I want to know Christ, know him deeply. And the power of his resurrection, and here's the one that always confuses people, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. Let me explain what that goes. If you go back a little further in Philippians, in Philippians 2, Paul is talking about the incarnation. He who was God left that behind, took on human form, and dwelt among us. And the linchpin of that whole phrase is he goes, he became a slave, a servant, obedient, even unto death, even, Paul says, death on a cross. The whole key of Jesus, the whole fulfillment of Jesus' mission is that he became obedient to the call, even to the point of death on a cross. What Paul is saying in this passage is, that's what I want to be. I want to learn to be so faithful that even unto death, not till I'm uncomfortable, not till I really don't want to do that, not till it gets hard, but I want to be where Christ is. I want to be that obedient. I want to be that faithful. I want to attain, even if it means suffering, even if it means challenging, I want to know that. And then he says, I love the honesty, not that I'm there. All of us can say that. I'm not there. I don't want to be obedient sometimes. I don't want to do it. But the call of discipleship, the call of your purpose and my purpose, is to ask, am I growing? Am I being a witness? As the band comes and we get ready to close the service this morning, I want you to think about those. I want you in your own time to write them down. How are you doing that lifelong exploration of your relationship with Christ? Are you knowing things more? Are you studying more? Are you working more in the Bible? Are you growing more? Or is he just a picture that hangs on the wall or a curse word you say when things aren't going well? Do you have a rejection of worldly standards? That doesn't mean you have to go live with a hair shirt and eat locusts and wild honey somewhere in the streets of Cordillo. But it does mean you need to think about what your priorities are. If you're sacrificing everything so that you can have that stuff, and part of that everything is sacrificing Christ and your family and the gifts you've been given, you are investing in scubalon and need to pay attention. And last but not least, are you willing to change or grow? And remember, be careful. I am extremely willing for Joe Joyner to change and grow. I'm not nearly as willing for Larry Rollins to change and grow, and that's true for all of us. I didn't ask, are you willing for somebody else to adapt to what you want them to adapt to? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to grow? You see, here's the deal. It's an eternal scale to infinity and beyond. You're to be my witnesses everywhere you go to change the world, to change this broken humanity, to be the vessels for that power of the Holy Spirit in the world. Anything else is a waste of time. You may like hearing that. You may not like hearing that. I'm just calling them like I see them. And I'm just sharing what I've seen in the Word. And I encourage you to go look yourself. That you might be a witness that lives good news for all of those who need to hear it. As we close and sing this morning, I'm going to remind you the altar rails are down here. You may need to come. You can do it in your chair, but you can do it down here as well. You may need to come and have a moment with God. Say, Lord, need that help on priorities. Lord, where am I to be a witness? All of us have place to grow. We haven't achieved it yet. But let's not leave this place simply entertained for a few moments. Let's leave this place hearing that voice. It's not for you to worry about how the whole thing works. Go and tell. Share what you've experienced. Know God. Love neighbor. And that's more than enough to fill our days. Would you stand as we sing? As Larry said a second ago, This song's called Bring It All to the Table. And this is a reminder that God doesn't just want the bad or the good. He wants it all, y'all. So if you've got that one little thing that you're bringing this morning, God's looking at you going, I will take that. But if if you're going to give me that, why don't you just bring it all? So think about that as we sing this song. As a prayer for this week, just lift it all up.
anything that's going to just mess you up or get you off track this week. Is hear the voice of love is calling. There's a chair that waits for you. And a friend who understands everything you're going through. As you keep standing at a distance. Shadows of your shame. There's a light of hope that's shining. Won't you come and take your place? And bring it all to the table. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.